All right. So um, we had um, started discussing uh, the um, strengthening mechanism due to solid solution in, um, in, in and then again, as we are doing in this course, focusing on um, alpha iron, gamma iron, and, and steels, the alloys of these things. And so, um, and we were uh, going through the um, effects that uh, solutes have um, when, they, when they strengthen the, uh, the steel. Hmm? So the, the two main effects uh, are size effects, Yes, and um, and what we call the modulus effect. Mm -hmm. So the size effect is very simple to understand. Uh, you introduce an atom that may be, for instance, much larger than the iron atom. Yes, uh, for instance, uh, you introduce tungsten in uh, uh, ferrite, big atom. It's, it's going to uh, generate a distortion in the lattice, and, um, and, and that will have, as we will see, strengthening effect. Um, second, or, or you can ha add an, uh, an element that's that just, is, just the contrary. Hmm? Uh, for instance, uh, silicon or aluminum. Hmm? They will, they're smaller, and they will, they will give a, a, a lattice contraction. Hmm? And, and we'll, we'll um, uh, use a, a parameter called delta to describe this um, strain, this volume strain that you get hmm, around a, a, a solute. The other thing is when you add an element to um, uh, steel, you uh, locally you change the elastic properties. Uh, what you actually do is change the electronic properties and, and the binding, but it, you can understand this in terms of um, uh, uh, making this, the, the material locally um, softer or harder. You know? And th this will also have an impact on the, um, uh, on the strength. Hmm? How can you, for, for instance, you can have, uh, well, to, 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 uh, a very simple example is a vacancy. It's not really an alloying element, but a vacancy has basically no uh, modulus. It's, it's uh, modulus equals zero, right? So that will have very strong influence on the, 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 the strength of the material hmm? because of this big difference in modulus. Hmm? And then there are a number of uh, uh, other less um, so why is this doesn't want to move oh, there we go okay so the, the, the size effect um, we use a parameter uh, delta, which is 1 over a DADC, uh, a being the lattice parameter, yes, and so DADC is the dependency or the change of the lattice parameter with the concentration of the solute, hmm? and uh, if you divide this by a, it's basically a, a strain, yeah? a strain. The modulus, we do the same thing, it's 1 over G, DG, DC, hmm? It's a relative change of the modulus with uh, the concentration of the solute. And then, uh, as I said, you have other uh, effects which may or may not have uh, an influence. Uh, we have what we call the chemical interaction. And when we refer to chemical interaction, we typically refer to the influence or the effect that solutes have on extended dislocations. Yes, and so. Um, this would be an effect that only occurs when we have stacking faults. Right? So in low stacking fault material, so it doesn't really happen in, um, a, a, in um, um, uh, ferrite or ferritic steels. Hmm? Um, and the reason is that uh, solutes may be um, uh, 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 migrating to the stacking faults and having an influence uh, on the, the motion of the dislocation in, in this way. Hmm? The, uh, sometimes when you add enough solutes, yes, um, you can have a phenomenon of ordering. Hmm? 
For instance, if you add silicon to ferrite, uh, first the silicon will be randomly uh, arranged, and then as you add more and more, um, for instance, past 10 or 12 atomic percents of silicon, similar things happen with uh, aluminum, you get an ordered phase. Yeah? Silicon and, uh, and iron will form a new crystalline structure because the silicon is ordered. Hmm? And uh, you form what is called a DO3 structure, for instance. Hmm? Okay, now, um, with the, which has a chemical composition of Fe3Si or Fe3Al. Yeah? Uh, but what you also have in alloys is that you have, and, and when you form SI, uh, Fe3Si hmm, or uh, Fe3Al, you have long range order. Well, that kind of order can occur at lower concentration, and then we, we talk about short range order. Hmm? So you basically have patches of ordering. Hmm? Um, and, um, of course, ordering can only have effects when you have enough alloying uh, present. Huh? So more alloyed, yes. And what it basically, what we're talking about is a preferred local arrangement of iron atoms and solutes. Huh? Now, um, when you have a, a, a normal crystal that doesn't have ordering, the when a dislocation passes through the crystal, before the, before the, uh, the dislocation, you have perfect crystal, and after the dislocation has passed, the crystal is perfect too. There's no change. However, when you have an ordered structure, most of the time when you have a dislocation passes through, this ordered structure is not kept after the dislocation has passed. So there is an energy difference before and after the passage of this dislocation. And this also leads to strengthening effects. Hmm? Hmm? Because short range order is present, you, the passage of dislocation partially removes order across the glide plane, hmm? and you basically randomize the crystal. Yes? And, and that has an effect on the uh, the stress you need to move next, the, the, the next dislocations through that same region. In steels, yes, we have a special kind of uh, strengthening effects which are due to the very strong relation between interstitials interaction, I should strong interaction between interstitials and dislocations. And we're talking about carbon and nitrogen interstitials mainly. Hmm? And uh, we have a phenomenon that's called snook ordering. Snook ordering. And it's a very simple effect. It um, it is due to the, the fact that carbon and nitrogen interstitials have a high diffusivity. So at room temperature, yes, carbon and nitrogen typically um, uh, make one jump, one jump from one octahedral place to another octahedral place, yes? So you can have effects that are due, or interactions that are due to this very short range diffusion, yes? And that is what snook ordering is about, is that you have dislocations passing through the lattice, yes? And at room temperature, the carbons in the vicinity of this, that are in the vicinity of the core of the dislocation can move from an, to an energetically more favorable place, yes? And thereby, they um, slow down, they, they form obstacles to the dislocations. We'll, we'll talk about this in more detail because it is important. What does it mean, for instance? You, do, you, you take an, uh, a ferritic steel, a carbon steel, 
and um, you, you, uh, you, you, you measure the stress strain curve, so, but you don't go all the way. You stop after a few percents of strain, yes? So it, originally there is no um, uh, yield point or anything. You have a, a, a nice continuous uh, uh, yielding behavior. So you deform a little bit, few percent, three, four percent, you stop. Yes, you, you, so you remove the load, and after a few seconds, you measure again. And lo and behold, you have a yield point there. Yes? That yield point yes, is um, the, the, the proof of this snook ordering. Hmm? All right? And we also have um, electronic interaction. Yes? Hmm? So when um, we consider a dislocation in a metal, yes, you wouldn't think much about um, electronic effects, but we have stresses, yes, in the uh, vicinity of the dislocations, and that disturbs the normal uh, density distribution of electrons. There are now regions with different electronic densities, yes? We're not going to describe that in detail, uh, but so you can imagine different uh, densities, electronic densities, and then when you add an atom, yes, which have, has a different valence, different valence, valency uh, than iron, hmm? uh, that uh, uh, atom will interact electrically, as it were, with the, um, uh, uh, with this, uh, uh, with this new electronic distribution around the core of the dislocation. Hmm? Hmm? So, um, right, so, so electronic effects are changes in electronic density. Uh, Electronic, you may wonder, well, like, why do we talk about electronic density? There are some materials where uh, the dislocations are actually charged. Like if you think about ionic crystals, like sodium chloride, you also have dislocations there. Um, they're necessarily, they have a charge. At the end of the, uh, the, the dislocations, you, you have an electric charge, yes? Um, in, in the case of the, the metals, you don't really have a charge, but you have a, the distribution of electrons is altered. Hmm? So, and, uh, so electrons move away from regions that are in compression, hmm? and they go and reach, as it were, to uh, regions that are in tension. Hmm? And so you get a dipole, hmm? a dipole, an electrical dipole. Hmm? And a dipole can interact with a charged particle, yes? And that would be the charged particle is an element, a solute that you have added, which has a valency different than one of uh, that of iron. Okay, is that an important effect? No. Yeah. Basically, um, of these six effects, the big main one of which we know a lot is the size effect. Yes. Even if you wanted to take electronic effects into account. You'd be, you know, you'd have lots of difficulties finding any data about it. Okay, right. So let's start with the simple approach, which, which, which is uh, engineering approach with uh, solute uh, strengthening. Is well, uh, it's an empirical approach. We just assume that the strengthening is proportional to the solute concentration in mass percent. Right. Uh, there's no strong theoretical support for this approach, yes? Okay, uh, there are theories which give a linear relation between the amount of strengthening and the concentration of the solute, but there are other theories also. Hmm? So there's not there's no strong um, uh, support for this approach, but in practice it works. And the reason why it works is and uh, I'll, I'll make this point later on, is that 
we don't have much experimental evidence to support any of the available theories when it comes to solid solution strengthening in uh, steels. Hmm? So, um, and, it's, and the results are you know, good enough in, uh, very often because, uh, because the levels of alloyings are, are so low. Hmm? Okay. Right, and so we, a new, uh, uh, we assume a linear relation. Hmm? Uh, and when we, f when we do this, we see that uh, 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 interstitial solutes like carbon, nitrogen, boron, they have very high uh, strengthening effects in ferritic steels. Phosphorus, silicon, manganese are the next uh, ones. They have an intermediate strengthening effect. And then you have elements like nickel and moly have weak effects. And in certain cases, uh, chromium can even have a, s a softening effect. Hmm? Now, anything you know about solid solution strengthening in ferrite, yes, does not necessarily hold for austenite, yes? So, manganese is a solid solution strengthener in ferrite, yes, but it actually, it softens austenite. So, when you have an austenitic steel, you add manganese, it doesn't get harder. In fact, there are many cases where manganese makes it a softer material. So be very careful, okay? But as a rule, interstitials increase the, the strength. Hmm? So carbon and nitrogen have high strengthening effects in austenitic steels. And then silicon, titanium, and moly have a strong intermediate uh, stabilizer, uh, um, strengthening effect. Hmm? Manganese and nickel do not have a pronounced solid solution strengthening effect in austenite. Hmm? All right. Hmm? And so, um, so we have lots of data to, um, to rely on. Hmm? For instance, this is iron phosphorus uh, graph. You can see nice linear relation. Uh, with silicon, it's, uh, there's a lot more scatter in the data, but we can draw a straight line through it. Uh, iron aluminum, again, straight line, yes, for and which supports this empirical approach of saying, well, strengthening is proportional to the uh, weight percent or mass content of uh, the alloying element. Yeah? And the same thing for um, uh, austenite, austenitic steels. For instance, an example here, a recent example for a twip steel, add some aluminum, you see a linear increase in the strength. So, um, uh, and, 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 and so you can derive from this 20 megapascals per uh, mass percent of aluminum that you add, yes? And so you can use this in practice. Hmm? However, when you do this, um, and this is a, a list of the, uh, some of the solid solution strengthening factors that I have found in the literature, yes? Um, so you see two things. First of all, uh, there's lots of data out there, so many people have looked at this. Yeah? Uh, second, if you look at the data, it's very puzzling, right? Take, for instance, uh, interstitial hardening effects, yes? Carbon, 5,500 44 megapascal per weight percent is one of the measurements, uh, one of the reported measurements. 2,263 is another value, yes? So, a huge difference, obviously, yes? Uh, the same for nitrogen. I mean, I go 5,015, yes? Um, some elements, you have very little information, yes? For boron, I only find one one value. Phosphorus, same thing. It goes 1,200, 500. Silicon, 140, 60. 32, 80. So huge differences. Lots of scatter. Well, this, of course, reflects the fact that when people do these measurements, yes, very often they do this on steels. Yes? And so 
the concentration of the elements yes, uh, is never measured perfectly. Hmm? In the sense that, for instance, in the case of this carbon here, are we sure that the person who did the measurements checked that there was no carbon present as cementite or a transition carbide? How sure are we that the carbon yes, um, was not segregated, for instance, to grain boundaries? We, all, we don't know this information, right? But it's very important, of course. Yeah? So ideally, yes, the best measurements are the ones that are made on single crystals and perfect binary solutions. Yes? So there, there shouldn't be any precipitation. Yeah? Okay. Well, and obviously, in the case of carbon, it's really difficult to control because carbon is basically insoluble in ferrite. So how can you get reliable data? Hmm? So it's, it's a challenge, all right? Um, so what, what do I do? I'm not, this is, it's an empirical approach, so, you know, um, and, and it's not based on theory. So what do you do in practice? Um, because it's not that these, these measurements are bad, you know, like, oh, this is a bad measurement and this is a good measurement. I have, you know, they're all good measurements. They're based on, you know, the author measuring a different manganese contents and put it through a line through it and that's what uh, that person obtains so there's, perf there's nothing wrong with that so what i do is uh, i collect these and i choose the median value yes so the, the me not the mean value the median that's the value that's in the middle of the row right so if you have five five data points well, like here, I have seven. Yeah, the middle one, 830, uh, 830 megapascals. That's the one I use. Yes. Uh, here I have an even number of uh, values, so I, I choose the, the value that's midway between these two. Okay, the median value. Yeah. That way, uh, I kind of use a statistical approach that doesn't. Um, um, uh, that minimizes the effect of outliers because there may be out data out there that's really not good, yes, but I have no way to judge. In order to minimize the impact of outliers, I use median values, yeah? And if you use these uh, values, you find data that's actually very often used or close to what's very often used, yeah? Okay, and here you have data for austenite. And of course, um, the, the strengthening elements here are, except with the exception of carbon and nitrogen, uh, are different, right? You have silicon, niobium, titanium are the, 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 the strengtheners and not phosphorus, silicon, and manganese as in the case of uh, ferrite. Another thing that's important is, is here. It's basically the same data you've just seen, except I compare them to each other. So it's the same y-axis, solid solution strengthening, ferrite, and austenite. So what do you see? You see that the general level is lower. You see? The interstitial atoms strengthening, the substitutional atoms, the level of strengthening in austenitic steels is much lower. So you cannot expect in austenite, austenitic steels and, and austenite in general, to get the same amount of strengthening that you get in ferrite or ferritic steels. Yeah? Hmm. For instance, uh, just an example. For phosphorus, we have about 800 megapascal per weight percent. Yes? There is no, not a single, not a single substitutional element in austenite that has this type of strengthening effect. Okay. So much lower solid solution strengthening in austenite than in uh, ferrite. Right? So how do, how do you work? You know, how do I use this, uh, this approach? It's very simple. I have an example here. Say you have an IF steel, a titanium IF steel. 
So in this decomposition, it has 30 ppm of carbon, 30 ppm of nitrogen, 0.15 manganese, 0.05 silicon, and 120 ppm of phosphorus, okay? So first of all, think, yes? Is there any carbon or nitrogen in this steel, yes? You, you remember nitrogen and carbon have huge infect, impact in terms of strengthening. In these steels, the effect of carbon and nitrogen on the strength is a big zero. Why? Because we've added titanium. The titanium stabilizes the nitrogen. And it also stabilizes the carbon. So there is no, no carbon and no nitrogen in solution. So there is also no strengthening from nitrogen and carbon. Yes? Okay, so always be careful with this, okay? So there's no solute strengthening from carbon and nitrogen in these steels. However, there may be an excess titanium. Usually, in order to make sure all the carbon is precipitated as carbon, uh, uh, titanium carbide, or as uh, all the nitrogen is precipitated as titanium nitride, we add enough titanium. So do we have some excess titanium, yes? So this excess titanium is in solution, and you need to take care of that amount in solution, not the total amount, the amount in solution, the amount that doesn't form the nitrides or the carbides, yes? So typically, um, this excess is about 200 to 300 ppm, and, and um, in this case, we'll just say it's 200 ppm. Hmm? Okay, so the, what, how do you calculate the yield strength, for instance? Yes, um, the yield strength is the friction stress. Yes, w what's the friction stress? That's our pile stress, yes. Pile stress is temperature dependent, yes, it's the, the thermal part. Uh, it's basically the critical resolved shear stress that, you know, times two. Um, I like to use 39. Um, but you could use 40, I mean, there's this, this experimental, so, but, okay, that's about the value. And then you multiply uh, the strengthening effect. So for uh, manganese, I have, I had in my table here. Uh, let's go back here, if I'm right. Right, so you have here, uh, 43.9, right? That's this median value. Okay, so, so here, 43. I multiply with the, the weight percent of manganese. I do the same for silicon, phosphorus, titanium, and aluminum. In, in my composition, I sum this all up 63, okay? Now, 63 is very low, yeah? 63 is a very low value uh, for the yield strength. Uh, but that's the value. That's the value takes into account the, f the lattice friction, yes, and the, the solid solution strengthening. Hmm? It's low. Um, usually when you do a measurement on an IF steel, yes, uh, and, and there it's very important to, when it's not tamper rolled, yes, it's very low, it's, it's around 100 to 150, yes, very soft. Uh, that's still far away from the 63, why is that higher in practice? Well, first of all, we didn't take into account any of the other strengthening effects which we'll discuss. Well, um, the, we form precipitates when we make titanium carbide, titanium nitride. That has a strengthening effect. And of course, we have grain boundaries which act as uh, a strengthening also. So the grain size is not taken into account precipitates are not taken into account, and these will be, we'll see. Um, and of course, there are a few, there, is a, 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 there are some dislocations, it's not a very sizable uh, density, but so dislocations, grain boundaries, and precipitates will contribute to this yield strength also. Hmm? Okay, so, but that we haven't discussed, and, um, but this is the contribution of the, uh, 
lattice friction and the solid solution strengthening in the material. 63 megapascal. Okay? So, of course, this, this is a very, very lightly alloyed material. Okay? If I had um, uh, half a percent of silicon and one point uh, percent of manganese, it, you'd, you'd have a much higher value. Okay? All right. So, but now let's go back to um, uh, the theory now. Okay? So, so now we're going to try to understand where does the strengthening come from uh, and, and, and look at theoretical models. Yeah? Well, first of all, you have to know uh, so we'll f that we'll focus on only two contributions, the size effect and the modulus effect. Okay? So, and as I've told you, the size effect is the most important one, first of all. What is it, what's with the size effect? Hmm? So, it really depends on whether we're talking about an interstitial atom or a substitutional atom. And it also depends on whether we're talking about alpha iron or gamma iron. Whether we're talking about uh, ferritic steel or austenitic steel. Okay? So let's start with interstitial atoms. The carbon in iron. So let's look at an elementary uh, volume, yes, of the size of a uh, of the lattice, the unit cell in the lattice, a little elementary volume, yes, yes, and we assume now that we insert, yes a carbon atom in this position, yes, in the lattice. Hmm? Yes. Then we find out that this spherical volume is distorted into an ellipsoid, yes? So it becomes stretched in this direction and it's compressed in the two perpendicular directions, yes? This kind of lattice straining is called a tetragonal distortion, and it gives rise to strain ellipsoid. That's what happens when you introduce carbon in the ferrite lattice. And you've heard this before. Let's see, this is what happens in, in reality. This is the cubic unit cell of alpha iron. When you, I put a carbon in the octahedral position, the lattice is stretched in this direction, and when these two atoms are pushed away, these four atoms move in. So, what used to be a, a spherical uh, space, yes, in, uh, in this lattice becomes an ellipsoid. Hmm? If I have a substitutional, yeah, so this is for interstitial, Impurity. This is for a substitutional. Uh, let me backtrack. Let, uh, let's keep. The, uh, I'm still discussing interstitials here, but I'm discussing interstitials in gamma iron. When you put a, a carbon in the lattice of gamma iron, yes, yes, and you consider a little space, circular, a spherical space around the position where you do this. What happens is the lattice expands isotropically. Yes? So I don't get a ellipsoid. I get an isotropic distortion. Yes? So what happens? Well, that's the case of carbon in gamma iron. When I put carbon now in an octahedral position in gamma iron, I push up these two atoms, and I also push away these four atoms, yes, in the plane perpendicular to uh, the, uh, this axis, yeah? So, in the case of substitutional atoms, always, whether it's alpha iron or gamma iron, I always get isotropic distortion. So either this elementary volume expands or contracts, depending on the, the relative size of the 
uh, solute. Mm? So for instance here, I've changed the central iron atom in my BCC unit cell by uh, another atom that's larger. It, the, the lattice will expand in three directions, yes? I put uh, a, um, in gamma iron a solute atom here, a larger solute than iron atom in the lattice, yeah, substitutional position, and the lattice expands isotropically. Yeah? So th that would mean that in alpha iron, when I have uh, interstitial, I get tetragonal distortion, and when I get substitutional, I get isotropic distortion. Yes? Yeah. In the case of gamma iron, when I put in carbon, I get isotropic distortion, and I put in substitutional alloy, I get also isotropic distortion. Is that true? Not really. You can get also tetragonal distortions in gamma iron and in austenitic steels. And the reason is because carbon will often form a complex. It will associate itself with another point defect, another solute, or a vacancy, for instance, yes? And that will give you a tetragonal distortion around the carbon atom. Hmm? So in alpha iron, the carbon atom will always give rise to tetragonal distortion. In the case of gamma iron, yes, I will get a distortion if the carbon atom is associated with a substitutional uh, atom or with other lattice defects, yes? Right, so, so the, of course you're gonna ask me the question, well, how, you know, this is really, uh, we, t we talk about the atomic l uh, level, and the amount of distortions are m tiny, yes? So how do you measure this? Well, it's very simple. You just measure lattice parameters, yeah? So for instance, if I take um, uh, uh, gamma iron, austenite, and I add carbon, yes? I add carbon to gamma iron. What do I find? I find that the lattice the unit cell of the, of, uh, just increases, or becomes larger. So it's isotropic. If I do the same with carbon, oops, this should be, this is, a, this is um, alpha iron here. If, please change this. Just, um, this is an error here. It should be alpha iron, please. Um, what you, um, what you, what you get is, and you can see this effect in martensite. Why do we need to make martensite? Because the solubility of carbon is zero in ferrite, so you have to go make martensite. What you see in martensite is that as you add carbon, you, you get a tetragonal distortion, of course, and that's because carbon gives a tetragonal distortion of the octahedral space. Yes, and you can actually use these two parameters to calculate very precisely what the strains are. Hmm? In us, in, in, uh, for substitutional atoms, it's very simple. If you add aluminum to iron, yes. If you add silicon to iron, chrome to iron, BCC iron, the lattice expands or contracts uh, uh, homogeneously, hmm? and so you can use. Um, the slope of this line to compute the change of the lattice parameter with the, the concentration. Yeah? So you can, and it's basically the slope of this here. Uh, it gives you, for instance, uh, 0.03 nanometers per, uh, per atom. Um, okay, and, on, and for silicon you can do the same. Yes, and uh, as you see here in this graph, uh, the, uh, you can have homogeneous isotropic expansion, but you can also have isotropic uh, uh, compression, yes? That depends on the relative size of the 
um, um, of the atoms. Yes? And, and so here you have a list. There's a lot is known about this. Uh, uh, but even here, uh, if you collect all the data that you can find in the literature, there, there is a range of values available um, and you kind of have to choose amongst these values, yes, for this, this delta. Hmm? And so what this delta is, is basically the, 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 the linear strain, yes, of the lattice parameter um, with uh, addition of the, the alloying element. Hmm? So that is a, an important parameter, yes, and so now we need, in order to understand uh, solid solution strengthening, we need to um, understand how, you know, what's the interaction and how, how do we um, describe this interaction and how, um, and what are the, the important parameters, yes, in this interaction. So first of all, um, so for, for the sake of simplicity, you know, to make the, the geometry simple, what I have here are uh, a, a row of atoms, yes? And, and here this, uh, these cups, cusps here are a dislocations, a dislocation, excuse me, that has run into these, uh, these atoms. We just think of them now as obstacles, yes? And we'll see how you know, how, how the interaction actually works, yes? But just think about them as obstacles, yes? So the dislocation will bow out between um, the two uh, solutes, yes? And this bowing out will continue until we reach a critical point and the uh, dislocation is released by the obstacle, yes? Okay. So. Let's say, um, so, what, what, can we measure, what can we measure here, yes? Yes, so we have this. So we have uh, my dislocation is running through the crystal, yes? It arrives here, it bows out, yes? And uh, it continues to bow out, yes? yes, like this. And then at a certain value of my external, so um, you, you know the external stress is tau times b on the dislocation, yes? Uh, if I have a certain value of the stress, I will have a certain value of the radius. I, as I increase the stress, yes, it will, uh, it will bo uh, bow out more, and at a certain critical value, it will, it will be released, yes, the, the yeah, uh, and so that's at, the, at, a, at a certain critical value, yes, mm -hmm. okay, so, what do we have what are the, the forces that are in place when, uh, when we have this interaction? Hmm? Okay, so you have to think about the obstacle, yes? Okay, and, uh, and, and you have to think about the, the dislocation, all right? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a, a pair of scissors Yes, pair of scissors, I'm going to cut this off here, yes, and I'm going to cut this also here, same pair of scissors, yeah. cut this off, yes. So um, in order to uh, keep uh, the, um, uh, uh, the balance here, yes, I need to have restore a force Yes, along the, the piece that I've cut off, yes. And I need to consider the force of the obstacle that balances this, yeah, okay. 
Now, what is this force? Well, this force is nothing else than the tension that's, that works on the line. That's the dislocation line tension. That's, that's a constant value, yes? And what's working in this direction is the force of the obstacle on the dislocation, which we call F. Hmm? Now, what happens when you increase the, or rather decrease the radius of curvature here, right? When, when you are moving, making the cusps larger, yes? The cusp is larger, yes? Like this. the force actually becomes larger. Hmm? So let, let me draw here a vector diagram, it's, it's, it's better. So this is for, so I have T here, T here. The force of the obstacle is, has to balance this, yes? When the, uh, uh, the, um, the stress on the dislocation increases and I have a lar uh, uh, more pronounced cusp here. The T is now, the dislocation line tension is oriented this way. This is now the force that the dislocation has to, uh, the, the obstacle has to uh, exert on the dislocation. And when this F value reaches, or when, when the sum reaches a maximum, yes, then the obstacle releases the dislocation, yes? So what is important here is this angle phi, yeah? And if this is F max here, say, so F is now F max, this angle here, now the dislocation will break away from the obstacle, yes? This angle is the critical angle, yes? Phi C, yes? And of course, if the, this, if the critical angle is this one, if this would be the critical angle, yes? Max. So in, in other words, F max is this. Yes? So this would be a weak obstacle. Yeah? Whereas this is a strong obstacle. Yes? So weak obstacles have phi C's are small. The critical angles are small. Strong obstacles have phi C very large. Yes? So if I would look into a material with this location and I could make a snapshot of dislocations moving through a material with strong solute dislocation interactions, the, the dislocations would look like this. Yeah? This would be strong. If I would look into a material where I have a solute which gives me weak uh, interactions, weak, weak obstacles, the dislocations would look like this. Yes? Because the break off, the breakaway angles, phi, would be very large. Yes? Here, the breakaway, the break angles, here, this angle here, would be close to so pi over 2, 90 degrees, right? Very small angles. In this case, yes, phi critical is, all, is close to zero, yes? So the, the, the shape of the dislocation tells me something about the strength of the interaction, okay? So, so let's put this in a little bit of formulas here. Well, first of all, we have, let me see if I can get the pen here. Okay. So first of all, we have the force on the dislocation, so that is tau times b times the length of the dislocation, so that's the force on the dislocation, 
Okay, and uh, yes, and and so, and if I, I concentrate on the situation here, yes, uh, I have basically, yes, um, the line tension going here, the line tension going there. Yes, the sum of these two is what? Yes, if we know that this angle is phi, is two t sinus. Phi. So, 2t sinus phi, yes, balances the external force, yes, and so I can rewrite this equation very simply by using what we know t to be, g b squared divided by 2, right, and so uh, this uh, so this equilibrium hmm, of these three vectors can be expressed like this, okay? But I, I also know what, what the force is on the dislocation because that's, I apply it externally, right? So from the, uh, in, in terms of the externally applied force, I, I have tau times V times L. And, okay, and now if we look at the breakaway moment, yeah, so we have the critical shear stress, B times L, is F max, and F max is, 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 is simply this equation here, where phi is the critical break-off angle. Hmm? So now I, I write this as tau C is equals to GB divided by L times cosine of the critical angle. Yeah? Okay, so, so this is, what is this? This is the shear, the shear stress applied to the dislocation. So that's nothing else. That's coming from the externally applied stress, right? So, so this tells me something about the strength of the material, yes? G and B are materials parameters. There's the, the modulus and the Burgers factor. So that's a given. So what are the two important parameters? L and this angle, the critical breakaway angle. Hmm? So phi C tells me something about the strength of the interaction. Yeah, like I said there, phi is large, it's a weak interaction. Phi is small, it's a strong interaction. Yes, is it here? large, weak. Interaction, small, strong interaction. And then the other thing we need to know is the obstacle spacing. But basically, if I have information on these two things, I can calculate strengthening. At no moment in this discussion did I ever say, was, it, what did I ever, was there ever anything specific about the obstacle? Actually, the obstacle in this particular uh, chapter are solutes, but they could be particles, they could be dislocations, they could be anything, really. So this is actually, this equation here, yes, yes, it's actually a very fundamental equation, yes, in um, when it comes to strengthening mechanisms in steel and actually in any crystalline uh, solid, yeah. Um, Okay, so let's um, just, I mean, just so you have a feeling of, for numbers here, right? Um, so let's, let's calculate one of these angles. Say, say we know um, some parameter values, what is the, what's the typical angle? Hmm? So this, this angle is determined by the, is the maximum resisting force of the solute F and by the line tension of the dislocation, right? That's basically, so, okay, well, um, we're, we're going to try to say something about uh, solid solution strengthening. So let's say we have a uh, uh, silicon or manganese and ferrite, yes? And, um, and we're only going to, we're going to look at the misfit uh, effect on the strengthening. So we need to use the parameter delta, 
yes? And for, for silicon and manganese, it's if you go through the list, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, that's the typical value for delta. Hmm? And let's, let's take uh, 0.03, yes, as a, uh, a value. Hmm? So what is the force now uh, for a single solute, for a single manganese atom will exert on the dislocation? Now, this you have to accept for me. One-fifth GB squared times delta. We, I haven't shown, proven it now. We'll, sh we'll show it later. But we ne need to have some formula for F max if we want to calculate a critical uh, angle. Yes? So, but let's assume, and actually this is a very useful formula. If you um, are ever uh, doing this kind of calculation, this is a, a good formula to, um, to get a, um, an idea, a very reasonable idea of the, the force that a solute will have on the um, uh, dislocation. Anyway, so, so you have this formula and then you plug in all these data values. So this is the, uh, the value of G, this is the value of B, and this is delta. Okay, and you calculate this and you find a very, very small force of about 3 times 10 to the minus 11 newtons, yes? Okay, now, second thing we need to calculate is the line tension. Hmm? Yeah, be because the uh, uh, phi C is the arc cosine of F max divided by 2T. Hmm? So, the line tension is GB square over 2. Okay, so that's easy. Uh, so this is 1 over 2, this is G, yes, and this is again B square, right? So tau is 2.46 times 10 to minus 11 newtons. So I can, I can calculate phi C, right? So this is calculate here is 1.56 radians or uh, 89.66. 89. So that's only one degree off 90 degrees, or half a degree off 90 degrees. So that means that your dislocations will be interacting with the uh, with a manganese or a, a silicon atom. Yes, they will bend out a little bit, and then they'll quickly be released by the obstacle. Yes. So it's it's what we call a, a weak interaction. Hmm? So and that. It's, you will usually find this very close to 90 degrees. Huh? So the dislocation will have a relatively straight shape in the crystal. Yeah? Cool. And, um, and, and so we have weak obstacles. Yeah? Weak obstacles in the sense you know, that you don't have these very large cups, cusps are being formed. Yeah? Uh, don't forget, this is a one single atom, right? Of course, uh, uh, the, the, the strengthening comes from adding more atoms yeah, to, uh, to get more solute solutions, strengthening. Okay, so, right. so now, um, how do we calculate this F, right? So obviously you can feel uh, when we calculate F, we need to have, uh, sorry, the phi C, the critical angle, we need to have F and T. T is the line uh, tension, so that's no problem. I only need G and B to calculate this. To calculate F max, that's a little bit more of a, a challenge here. So I need to say something about the interaction between the dislocation and the solute. Okay, so say for instance, here is the lattice, and here is the dislocation, and in this lattice I've put in, yes, an atom, a misfitting atom. Yeah, so so uh, there will be, um, around this atom, there will be a displacement. Yeah? This is a misfitting atom. It's larger than the iron atom. So uh, around it, the lattice will be squeezed. So I can calculate what the uh, uh, distribution is of the uh, displacements of the atoms. Yes. I can act, calculate the, the shear strains at, the, at these interfaces. You know, if you can think of shells um, around, surrounding these atoms. Hmm? 
and the shear stress that applies. Hmm? I'm, I'm not going to go too much in the math here because the math is rather um, lengthy and uh, I'm, I'm more interested in, um, in, in giving you the results so you can work with those. Hmm? But anyway, so th that's the idea. So the interaction here will depend very much on um, actually where you put the, the dislocation also. So because if the dislocation goes passes on this plane, yes, I will get a very different interaction than if the dislocation passes a little bit away from the atom, yes? And if it's very far away, it will not feel the, the, point, the, the, the solute, yeah? So, okay, so, but we, so you, what, we, what, we, what we'll first try to do is we'll try to determine the interaction energy. Hmm? What's the interaction energy between a dislocation and a misfitting obstacle? Hmm? Okay, right, so, um, so this is a, uh, just a, um, a schematic here. Hmm? So this is a solute here, and say the interaction energy looks like this. It's a, it's a well, a potential well. So basically, this means that the dislocation is attracted, is attractive, yes? It doesn't have to be this way. It can be repulsive also, yes? So the dislocation comes here, yes, is attracted to this potential well, Yes, yes. And then when you want to move it out of the potential, you have to increase the stress on the dislocation to pull it out of this attraction, yes? So, but that's not the force, of course, because that's just the interaction energy. So the force is the derivative of this energy. So, and of course, the, the dislocation so the, the obstacle has an influence on the dislocation, and of course there is a, and vice versa, the dislocation has an effect on the obstacle, right? So if I do, if I want the force on the, uh, the dislocation, yes, force on the dislocation, I have to do minus the derivative of the energy. So that looks like this, yeah? so this and this. So if it's attractive interaction, the dislocation will get, when it comes close to the defect, it's going to be pulled into, pulled towards the defect, yes, yeah, to the point. And then when, when the dislocation needs to go beyond the, um, uh, the solute, it will have to be uh, pulled loose of the uh, uh, point defect or, or the solute. Yeah? Okay, so that's, that's the shape of the force, yes, okay, force distance uh, relation here, okay, all right, so, so let's do a little bit of uh, math here, because we do need to do this, so we have the distortion around a substitutional alloying element, yeah, and it is this distortion that interacts with the stress field of dislocation, and so this, in, this interaction leads to an increase or a decrease of the elastic strain energy of the lattice. Hmm? Okay, so uh, in, in this discussion or in these theories, we assume that the atoms are uh, elastic spheres with a certain radius. It's inserted into um, a spherical lattice hole created by removing an iron atom with a radius Ra, hmm? and it's the relative size difference between substitutional atom and iron, yes, that is of importance. Yeah? So, um, and so we, we use this parameter delta, and delta is, is uh, nothing else than this, this ratio here, is the uh, difference between the radius of the solute and iron atoms divided by R. So it's the, the radial strain, if you want. Yeah? So you can rewrite this, um, or RS is one plus delta R iron, okay? And this is the important parameter. This basically gives us an idea of this, the amount of strain that you have, um, volume strain, but it's a linear parameter, yes? So you can calculate the volume difference Yes? 
uh, between the solute and the solvent atom because th it's the volume strain that's important here, yes? And you get what's called this misfit volume, yeah? So that's basically, um, uh, it's basically calculating uh, the, 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 the change in volume, yes, that, uh, that needs to be accommodated in the lattice. Yeah? So that is uh, given here, yes. We assume, or actually we know that delta is a very small number, so we, we can uh, simply um, do this simplification here, and that gives me this value for the misfit volume, yes? Okay, right, so, so if I have an isotropic uh, point defect, yeah, I get this uh, misfit volume. Say it's a large misfit, it's a large atom, right? So you will have a hydrostatic pressure there, okay? okay. Hydrostatic pressure, yes, uh, at the interface between the substitutional atom and the iron matrix. Yeah? And so I get elastic strain energy. Elastic strain energy. Now, uh, which, is, which is equal to the work done by pressure uh, against the volume change. So this, this would be this energy. Hmm? So it's P times this delta V. I didn't say at this stage what this pressure is. Yeah? So it's, it's basically P times this. Okay? So that is elastic strain energy. All right. Okay. So now let's backtrack a little bit here and say, uh, do we have uh, a hydrostatic stress associated with dislocations? Hmm? Yes, yes we do. Hmm? The hydrostatic stress is uh, minus, in this particular case, uh, we use minus because it's, it's easier for us to work with, uh, sigma xx plus sigma yy plus sigma zz divided by 3, where these are the principal stresses. You remember this value, right? That's, that's the, um, in, in the, the theory of plasticity, we've seen this, right? That's, that's the, the stress along the, uh, the um, yield surface, yes? That's your uh, mean stress, yes? Okay? So we can compute this. Let's have a look at uh, how much this is. How, 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 do you, how would you compute it? Well, uh, you look for sigma xx, sigma yy, sigma zz in mm, the previous lectures, yes? For an edge dislocations, uh, these are the formulas, yes? And if you make the sum of these three, yes? And you divide by three, this is what you find. This is the, the hydrostatic stress associated with a edge dislocation. And it's, it's a function of the, the position, yes, in space around the dislocation. All right, so, um, well, why don't we put some numbers in, right? Okay, uh, so this is the formula that was on the previous page. Um, for reasons uh, that will be clear in a moment. I'm going to simplify this formula by using, uh, instead of x and y, I'm going to use uh, x is equal to r cosine theta, yeah? and y is equal to r sine theta. Yes, I'm just going to use um, uh, this transformation. It, because it simplifies the, the formula to, to this here. Yeah. So this y divided by x squared plus y squared now becomes sine theta over r. Yes? And, and that allows me to, to compute uh, this p-value simply. So let's say we're looking at alpha iron. We have an edge dislocation here. Yes? And we want to know well, what, what would be the maximum uh, maximum uh, hydrostatic pressure I can get around the, uh, the core. 
well, uh, well, I'll just choose uh, theta equals to one. That's uh, sorry, uh, sine theta equals to one. Yes, that's that's definitely going to give me a, a large value. I'm going to choose r, a certain distance away from this location, of about 10b. That's the distance. Yes. Yeah. And uh, G uh, is uh, 81.5 gigapascal. So that I can calculate B. And I find 1.6 gigapascal. So it's a pretty large, pretty large uh, uh, hydrostatic stress. Yeah. Okay. So what happens now? Hmm? I have a piece of material that wants to expand on one side, yes, and I have a hydrostatic stress somewhere else, yes, that can provide this deformation, yes, right? So if they come together, yes, the energy, yes, can be locally diminished, yes, by having the um, the um, hydrostatic pressure provide the work to um, uh, expand the lattice. Hmm? So the interaction energy is the hydrostatic pressure provided by the uh, uh, um, the, the dislocation times the volume change. And so it's basically what we derived uh, just now. Hmm? So uh, times, so that is the hydrostatic pressure, and that is the delta V. Hmm? And I can, um, I can express this in terms of uh, X and Y, or in terms of R and uh, the angle theta. Hmm? So, um, right, and I can... Uh, also use here, instead of using uh, this uh, r square, r to the third, uh, the radius of the iron atom to the third, I can use a delta v parameter. Delta v parameter is, is given, is, is nothing else than the lattice volume change due to one solute atom. Hmm? Okay. So it's, it's, the, it's this here. And you can see 4 delta this. So it's, um, it's a, an alternative way of um, using this. Hmm? The same equation. Right. So let's, okay, so let's, I just want to take one more minute. Um, so, so for instance, what does this mean? Hmm? I have manganese interacts with an H dislocation in alpha iron. Okay, so this is my interaction energy, yes? I have all these parameters, yes? I know what G is, I know what B is, I know what the Poisson ratio is, I know what the radius is of R, my iron atom, and I know what delta is for manganese, yes? So I plug this all in into this energy equation, yes? Hmm? So the energy is now here. This is the, this is the result. This is the interaction energy. It's, it's, a, it's a potential well, yes? Hmm? And I now compute, for instance, in this particular case, I will compute the force on the solute, yes? That's the derivative of the interaction energy. So uh, the derivative of this line here is, is negative, of course. It reaches a maximum and then a so a minimum, a maximum, and like this. So, so this is the force distance relation. And in this particular case, it's, we've chosen y is equal to b. So y is the, 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 um, uh, the distance between the, um, the, the position of the atom is, is here. Yeah? And, and, and the dislocation moves this way. Okay. But by, so, so you, you can see obviously that depending on where, what this distance is, I'll have another profile, right? Okay. But I can calculate 
uh, from these different profiles what the maximum value will be, yes? And that will be F max, yes? Anyway, we're over time. Uh, we'll continue with this on Thursday.